The stoic qualities of Arlene Sanders was better suited to facing death than being irritated by her old buddy. Fly, what the hell are you talking about? She stomped to where I was going through a box of thin metal cylinders, perfect for the project growing inside my head. Yes, I said, it really could work. Using the special tone of voice normally reserved for dealing with mentally deficient children and drunken sailors, she said, Tell me what in God's name you're on about, Fly. I lifted my head from the box. When I was a kid, I wanted a car real bad. I mean real bad. Real real bad bad. Here we go down memory lane, she said with a shrug. See, I couldn't afford the car, I said, but I wanted one. Real, real, bad, bad? I mean, I'd have taken anything with wheels and a transmission. If I couldn't have a six, I'd settle for four, three, anything. But no matter how much I lowered expectations, I still couldn't afford a vehicle. Is this going somewhere, Fly? Or do I need to hitchhike back home to Mother? That's exactly right, I said. I'm talking about transportation. I couldn't afford a car, but I could afford a spare part now and then. And you know how this ended up? She put her hands on her hips, head tilted to the side, and said, Let me guess. You collected spare parts and collected and collected, and finally you were able to build your own F-20. Or was it an aircraft carrier? Am amphibious landing craft? I ignored her. I built myself a car. Had a few problems, no brakes exactly, but it ran. And what a powerful sound that baby made when she turned over. Arlene finally saw where I was headed. Memory Lane dead ended right here on Deimos. Fly, you're BSing me. No, I really built an auto. You are insane if you think you can build a freaking spaceship out of spare parts. I literally jumped up and down. You thought of it too, I said. Great idea, isn't it? We can build a rocket and get off this rock. She was very tolerant. Fly, an automobile is one thing. You're talking about a spaceship. I looked her straight in the eye. After all we've been through. You're gonna tell me we can't do this? She looked me straight back. Read my lips, she said. We can not do this. We have nothing to lose, A.S. It can't be any harder than taking down the spider mind, can it? You have a point there, she said grudgingly. So, how do you propose we start? She was always annoyed when I used reality to win an argument. I knew it was possible, but not without a manual. We need some tech, I said. Tech? Plans. Then we can give it to our design department. Don't tell me. I am the design department? I smiled. You're the design department. And what are you, Fly Taggart? Everything else. We went looking for a manual. Ten minutes later, we found one in the most logical place, which was the last place we looked, naturally, next to the coffee maker. I tried to get Arlene to make us a pot of coffee, but she stared at me as if I'd grown a third head. So, I made it myself. I'd forgotten that Arlene didn't indulge, but that was all right with me. I figured since I was the production line, I needed all the caffeine I could survive. Next we inventoried everything we had to work with. Our best choice was to make a small male rocket intended for one person, but capable of seating two, if they were really chummy. I wrote a list of parts needed, and found almost everything within three hours, except for a thingamabob. I knew what it was really called, but I couldn't think of it. We spent another hour searching, and though we didn't come across it, we located more tools that would be a measurable value. A screwdriver, a drill bit, 
a magnifying glass, and a paper punch. Enough for now, said Arlene. I'm sure the thingamabob will show up before we finish. We'd better get started. I have no idea how fast the air is leaking from the dome. We might have a month. We might have a couple of days. I wasn't going to argue with an optimistic Arlene. Hell, I hardly ever argued with the pessimistic one. We haven't looked under all the tarps, I said, and there are other rooms to check too. But there is one more shopping expedition required before we start work. We need enough food and water to hold us through the job, and all the spare liquid oxygen tanks and hydrogen tanks we can find. Arlene nodded. We were in a race with a bunch of air molecules, and they had a head start. In addition to oxygen for fuel, we actually needed to breathe now and again over the next few days. Weeks. Whatever. It would be cruel fate indeed if I screwed the last bolt and hammered the final wing nut only to kill over from oxygen deprivation. My brain was working overtime now. The pressure is dropping so slowly, we're not going to notice when it gets dangerous. Can you rig up something to warn us when to start taking a hit of pure oxygen? And regulate how much we should take. Yeah, it's a space station. I don't think I'll have much trouble finding an air pressure sensor and rebreather kit. She pulled a gouge pad out of her shirt pocket and started taking notes. She thought of something I'd missed. I'll look for warm clothes too, Fly. The temperature will drop as we lose pressure. Won't the sun warm us? We're no further away than Earth itself. We're underground. All this dirt makes a great insulator, unfortunately. First day, we were good scouts, gathering supplies for our merit badge and survival. I regretted that we couldn't move what we needed to a lower level and seal off one compartment. That would stretch survival by another month. But hauling the tons of material we'd need to build a rocket was impossible. Arlene scrounged a generous supply of food, most of it produced under the dome with considerable help from the genetics department. After watching the monsters produce assembly line out of the vat, I hesitated even to eat our own. Human experiments in recombinant DNA veggies and lab-grown meat. But Arlene wasn't queasy. She preferred the demos-grown peas and carrots to the real delicacy, frozen asparagus from Earth. I despise asparagus, she insisted. All right, so I hate okra. The slimy stuff was one of my childhood loathings. On the second day, we ran head-on into our first lesson in Spaceship Construction 101, namely, translating the manual from techie talk into English. Here, what should we make of this? The ZDS protocol provides reliable flow-controlled two-way transmission of unenriched fuel cell packet deliverables from nozzle to socket. It is a plasma stream, plas stream, or packet stream, SOC sec fuel packet protocol. ZDS uses the Union Aerospace Corporation double sequencing directed stream format. This format provides for nozzle spray and extern spray socket specification. Note, see the definition for ZDS redirect in section 38.12. Active or passive. Sockets utilizing the ZDS protocol are either active or passive. Nozzle processes must be directed into passive, external spray, sockets. They detect for connection requests from deliverable processes residing on the same or other nodes of the fuel cell packet path. Socket processes broadcast requests for active, directed spray, nozzles. They sidestep nominal delivery in favor of reverse directed, acknowledging, packet streams. All connections between nozzles and sockets must be sent to default active or passive protocol, depending on the anticipated fuel cell path delivery process. Warning: Failure to follow UAC active passive nozzle socket connection protocols may result in unanticipated fuel cell path combustion with undesirable results. 
I could translate the final warning pretty well. If we didn't figure out what the hell they meant by active-passive nozzle socket connection protocols, Arlene and I would become a rather spectacular fireworks display. Arlene was better at figuring it out than I was. She had actually taken engineering night courses during her shorters. I volunteered the use of my hands and a strong back if she'd turn the technical gobbledygook into the kind of instructions a marine can follow. Put this part here. Tighten that bolt, marine. Yeah, just like you to have the woman do all the hard work, she said. Just remind me to clean the carburetor before I work on the piston valves. It's not a car, you moron. Huh. I guess in space no one can hear you make metaphors. Amazingly, she didn't shoot me. Unfortunately, the rockets used by the Demos facility, hence all the spare parts, were short-hop lightweight supply rockets, never intended to carry a single human being, let alone two of us, and never intended to fight a gravity well like Earth's. There were a couple large bore rocket casings left over from God knows when, back before we had the MDM-44 plasma motors developed by Union Aerospace, and this was the key. I figured I could hot rod a 44 into a bigger cousin, cram it inside one of the old casings, and have enough juice to fling us off Demos, burn into the atmosphere, and break to a messy landing somewhere on Earth. My main goal was to keep from blowing us up. After frying our spider baby in JP-9 jet fuel, I had a new respect for the stuff. It beat the hell out of salad oil. Arlene squatted on an uncomfortable stool translating technical paragraphs into something I could understand. My optimist projection was to finish the task in ten days. Reality dragged ass. Starting our third week, we ran into the first serious problem. Trying to jerry-rig parts we couldn't find into configurations we couldn't figure out was a bitch, and I insisted we needed to test-fire the motor when I finally got a working model. We didn't have much time, but the motor was life and death. A must-test. We'd spent two days painfully assembling it, and I do mean we. Arlene enjoyed an excuse to get off her stool. Besides, it was a two-man job. We finally ended up with a sleek beauty two meters long and a meter in diameter, almost small enough to fit inside the old model rocket skin. Just a few odd pieces here and there where I thought I could supercharge the system, or where I couldn't find the correct part and had to substitute butter for eggs. A pair of start cables snaked into the machine from ten feet away where a switch box was connected to 27 50 volt NECAD batteries. I'd spent half a day welding steel bars together into a framework, sort of, kind of approximating the interior scaffolding in the mail tube. We bolted the motor inside, mooring it securely to the deck plates. Last, I attached a highly sensitive pressure sensor to the forward edge to measure the thrust. I'd trust Arlene to make the calculations, and tell me whether or not we would make it into orbit, or not. Want to say a prayer? She asked before I switched it on. Yeah, I wasn't always in trouble with the nuns. Maybe I can collect on a few good deeds. Arlene stationed herself behind a bulkhead. I reached over and flipped the switch, then dived behind cover. Superheated gases rushed out the back with a tremendous roar, and I could tell immediately it was too much force. I'd tweaked my rocket engine too good, but I couldn't switch it off. It was just a model, designed to burn until the fuel was gone. No cutoff valve. The scaffolding strained, groaning like a dying steam demon. <laughs> Whoops, remind me later. And I knew what was about to happen. Get your head down, I screamed. No use. She couldn't hear anything over the roar of the engine and the scream of steel twisting and ripping free. The mooring tore loose with a horrible, grinding noise, 
that for an instant even drowned out the 44. My beautiful, working rocket engine broke free, ate the pressure sensor with one gulp, and smashed through a dozen boxes of precious parts before making a smoking hole against the nearby bulkhead, leaving a perfectly straight series of holes like a cartoon.